Today, we have the privilege and honor of having with us a ex-POW, native of North Dakota here, born in Lisbon, uh, joined the service back in the 40s, and uh, went into the Far East. He became a prisoner of war of the Japanese, certain stationed in Philippines and Japan. And uh, today he's going to tell us our sto his story about how he how he won the war. So you just start right out, uh, Brownell, and and tell us uh, where you were born and where you went to school and how you got in the service and so on. Well, today is life, tomorrow's hope, and yesterday is but a dream. I was born in Lisbon in uh, 1916. Dad was born in Lisbon many years before that, and. Uh, my father ended up dying in Lisbon. So he never got very far away from home. But anyhow, I left Lisbon when I was about uh, 16 years old and I went to uh, uh, out to Astoria, Oregon because of the fact that no one, no one in North Dakota had a job. Everybody was looking for a job about that time, and, uh, except for the, our farmers. So when I got out to Astoria, Oregon, I had an opportunity to go into the uh, military into the United States Army and uh, they would send me right over to the Philippines. Being just a young man like that I was filled with adventure and there was a challenge. So uh, I put my right hand up and swore into the United States Army and uh, went over on one of the first uh, ships to the 31st Infantry which had been organized for far eastern duty back in uh, about 1920 or something like that. And uh, of course all the fellows that I enlisted with are men that are quite a bit older than I am and have been in the Orient all these years. So I was, uh, I was in the 31st Infantry back in 1941 when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And uh, <clears throat> then they went down into went down into the southern part of Luzon, and uh, that's where I was right out of Manila. And uh, we fought our way all the way up the uh, the Bataan. Well, what kind of what kind of duty now were you doing when you first got into the Philippines? Oh, when there? I first got into the Philippines, I was in a machine gun company, H Company, machine gun company, and. Uh, it was then that uh, we were sent to Bataan Peninsula, which is right off from uh, the background. Our background was Cregador. You could see Cregador most anywhere from there. And uh, that's where we were taken prisoner. Now, how, how were you taken prisoner? Can you explain that to us? Where, what, what kind of fighting you were at or where yes, you were? Yes, yes. We were in the mountains of, uh, of Mar Velas, uh, back of, uh, we're in the mountains of Mar Velas, and uh, when uh, the orders came out, why General Douglas MacArthur had already gone to the States, and General Wainwright was left holding the bag. He was our commanding officer. And he was the one who informed us by radio that uh, as far as the, they were concerned, the war was over. And he was, uh, he was too, was a prisoner of the Japanese. And we were, the Japanese moved in with all their motorized vehicles and uh, their, their tanks. And now is this near, near Manila? This was across the bay, across the bay from Manila. We were backed up by Cregador. And uh, the Cregador now hadn't surrendered. So Bataan goes down the drain and then Corregidor held out for, I think, about 15 to 30 days longer. And uh, with their heavy artillery and their uh, big guns. <clears throat> and uh, then when Corregidor went down the drain, why, well, wasn't more than a few days, and we began to see familiar faces in the prison camp of those that were on Corregidor. Now, Corregidor, was that, wasn't that a tunnel of some kind? Oh, no, Corregidor is an island. Island. There's but on the island, island, what did they have? Well, they had... Uh, I don't know what you'd call a 10. They're larger than a 105. It was a huge yeah. gun, and of course, the, all the guns on Cregador faced the China Sea because they never intended to ever have anyone come in from behind them. No. So anyhow, they uh, 
we were captured then and taken to... Uh, what did you do when you, by being captured, you just gave up then and just laid down well, your arms? Well, they, they, you would be shot if you uh, were caught with any arms. I see. And I was in the mountains back of, uh, of uh, Mar Velas, which was the southernmost point, and uh, came down out of the mountains and very cagely <laughs> looking for the Japanese. And uh, we got by without being bothered. And we were then we were taken to uh, to uh, Camp O'Donnell, which is right out of Clark Field. Now you've heard of Clark Field. Yeah. How far is that from Manila? I would say it was about 115 kilometers. How how did you get there then? How, pardon? How did you get there? Oh, well, we we were we were uh, taken up there. We like marched, train? marched, March. marched. All most of us marched up. There. How big a unit was that then that marched up there? Well, it would be the whole 31st Infantry. The whole 31st Infantry. And uh, do you have any food or drink or water or anything on the yeah, march? Yeah, the Filipinos were very kind to us. And they'd stand alongside the road and, and make signs to us. Like one of the signs was this. V for victory. I see. And of course, if the Japanese saw them make a sign like that, why well, they were shot. So they are very cagey about it. <laughs> Give us this. And uh, then they put food down on it. You go by, you scoop it up. And the food consisted of what they call Sally Goupons. Uh, uh, Sally Goupon is a beetle they used to roast, and oh, it was delicious. A uh, beetle that you crawled on the ground? Right on. How big a beetle is that? About this big. Oh. Mm -hmm. Sally Goupons, and uh, oh, there was other things that I can't even remember now. And uh, we'd live on, lived on all that stuff. On the way up there. Yeah, sugarcane was another thing. You see, that's, that country in there is sugarcane fields. On both sides of the road? Yes. Yep. Would you stop and break it off or eat it? Or the how? Filipinos would hand it to us and oh. then run like the devil. <laughs> they got out of the way, I'll tell you, because you, no sooner would they, you'd hear the Japanese Were, any, were there any guys killed there or shot uh, on the oh, way up? Oh, on any number of them. What did they do with them then? Did they let them bayonet run. them or what? They bayonet them mostly. They didn't, shooting them was, <laughs> it was kind of beyond the question because of the fact that they didn't like to waste the ammunition. <laughs> But bayoneting was a common practice. Children would come out and throw food to you, and then a Jap would bayonet him. And he'd die right there. Then. He'd die screaming. Yeah. How, then when you got to this, was that camp, what camp did you go to now? Camp what? Oh, we, we were heading north to, uh, come, uh, to uh, Tarlac, which is uh, south of Clark Field. And then from Tarlac, we went to a prison camp called O'Donnell. Where was that from Clark Field? That would be, uh, oh, maybe 30, 30 miles out of there. How, where would that be from Manila? Uh, about, 160, uh, about 120 miles from Manila. North? North. Yeah. And how long were you at that camp then? Uh, at, Cl at Clark, or not Cl uh, at Camp, o camp O'Donnell, I was there for about two months. two months. And then from Camp O'Donnell, we went to uh, Cabana de Juan. I was there two and a half years. Now, where was that located? It was on the eastern half of the island of Luzon. The big island in the, the south. The big island of Luzon. How far was that from Manila? That is east of Manila. Uh, we were about 120 kilometers out of uh, Manila, north of Manila. How did they treat you there then at Camp O'Donnell? Or uh, there weren't any of those camps there. They treated you at all. They, they didn't. beat you. They beat you. S slowness in working, uh, uh, being not prompt in roll call, uh, for any slight thing, the Japanese love to do that. They got their kicks out of that. <laughs> How would they beat you with the rifle butt or? Rifle anything? butt, mostly. Yeah, come over with a rifle butt. And then of course they all, they, uh, they all carried uh, uh, sticks, long sticks. And uh, because they were so afraid that they, someone might try to get a weapon away from them. Take it away, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they used that stick to uh, come maintain to the, the favorite. The favorite place to be hit a guy was right across there. Because all there's a lot of nerves right up in there. In the back. Shoulder, that shoulder blade. Yeah. Yes, that's 
Now that that camp, what did you eat there? What did you eat there? Well, you we didn't. Uh, we had to start out with was lugao. A lugao is r rice that dipped into uh, where you pour the rice into uh, a pan, bring it to a boil, and then pour it out. No, then you'd have to figure out how you're going to salt or sugar or whatever you use. Then they had mango beans. Oh, mango beans were delicious. All this food that I'm talking about is delicious. Yeah. Because well, we were hungry. You were starving, yeah. We were starving. And uh, mango beans. How did you divide the food then? Or who was the cook? We had, a, we had a mess hall set up for that purpose. And we had authorized personnel in there for that purpose. Yeah. And they'd split up all the rations. Yeah. Now there's a picture up there on the screen. What, uh, can you remember anything about that? Were there prisoners are standing uh, around this uh, place where they're getting the food, I believe. Yeah, that, that's the way it looked. Yeah. We had no clothes. We were, most of us wore G-strings, yeah. an oriental loincloth, yeah. and uh, hats were a, a, a premium because uh, of the beating of the sun. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> this looks like something that could have been taken out of Camp O'Donnell, which would have been right out of Clark Field. Yeah. And they, they, they take the food then and they distribute it? Uh, you had a ration officer? We had, we had officers that were, were rationed that food out. Now, were they Americans or Japanese? Americans. Americans, yeah. yeah we did. While we were in Cabana Duan prison camp, we didn't see as many of the Japanese except for the guards. Yeah, the perimeter on the outside of the camp. Right. The inside of the camp was operated by the Americans. Right, all by Americans, in the mess halls and all. Now, what about water? Did you get water there? We had water. We had uh, water details that came in so many times a day that bring fifty gallon, fifty gallon drums on yoho poles. There'd be three or four guys with a yoho pole that would be bringing that big barrel in, and that was the way we got our water. It came from some river or creek. What about the latrine facilities there? At a place like that, at that camp where you were. We for... didn't have any pro any problem at all with our plumbing. No. It was all du a hole. <laughs> a dug a hole. <laughs> and uh, they called straddle trenches. And we had a lot of our personnel that were so weak, so sick, that fell in and drowned. Died. A terrible way to die. Yeah. What about, uh, do you have any washing facilities or anything like that? Shaving or washing your face or cans? No, you had to do the, the, you had Water brought into you, for you could pour into your canteens, and that would be the extent of it. Yeah. And some of the guys didn't even have canteens. What about your sleeping conditions? Did you sleep by uh, we had a Well, <clears throat> well, I found two rice sacks. I found two empty rice sacks, and I hung on to them, thinking I'd need them sometime, and I did when I got to Cabana to Juan. And I went out and <clears throat> gathered coban grass, they call it, and fill these two great big sacks with COVID grass, and then took nails and went through and made a mattress out of it. That was the way I slept. Yeah. Then you had a you had a mattress. You didn't need any. How does the temperature there? Warm all the time? All the time. Night and day. Night and day. Nights you get a cool breeze. And of course, being the the the, the days were so hot, why well, you'd notice the difference in the temperature, and you'd probably chill. Yeah. But. Uh, <clears throat> the nights were beautiful. Yeah. What about the medical facilities for those that got sick and so on? We had, uh, we had American doctors that were prisoners, but they were just as bad off as we were. Yeah. And uh, they would try to uh, do everything they could to relieve the conditions. What about those men that died now? What did you, did you keep track of those or? <clears throat> we, had, uh, we had officers that kept track of them. Record. Made it, made it a point to keep track of the records. records. And they were taken to a common cemetery where there were 50 to 75 men to a grave. And then I understand that after the war was over, the burial detail from the United States Army came out there and went through. And they tried to, tried to save all the dog tags they could uh, for the, to put them on these bodies, knowing yeah. that this would eventually happen. So they were able to identify a lot of those, grave, those men. Even today, as we sit here talking, there's a big, beautiful American cemetery right out of Fort McKinley in the Philippines. 
that our men that were taken from that uh, from Cabana Duan Cemetery and buried at that and buried yeah. over there. They were, they were not brought back to the states. No, 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 no. Now, uh, yeah, how long were you there at that at that place? At that two and a half years. Two and a half years. What did you do then? Did you have a, any detail uh, work or any assignment? When oh, there? definitely. They had. A, they were building at that time. They were very optimistic, and they were building an airfield out of there, and they had us all working on that, leveling this fighter field, out of uh, out of uh, Clark Field. Yeah. Or out of Cabana to Juan, I should say. That was the name of Cabana to Juan, and. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think they ever completed that field, but they were sure conscientious about working there, and they'd take, detail, take uh, prisoners out of the camp. And there were a couple times when I was called and we went out on the detail. And it was unpleasant, to say the least. What, did they drive you out on the truck or march you out there? They drove you out on the truck. Then you were to level the ground. And we were working the grounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Manually? Yes. The equipment that they gave you to work with was <laughs> Pretty poor. Poor. Garden equipment. How about the guards? Were they pretty enthusiastic about working this field too, or were they? They had. They were. They were disagreeable. Well, that was because of the difference in nationality. Yeah. And of course, uh, they were yelling and screaming and hollering about this and hollering about that, and uh, we had to learn Japanese right away. If you didn't, you had the bumps to prove it. And uh, when they'd call to you and say, like, Hayako, Hayako, that meant hurry, 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 Hayako, Hayako. And uh, they were cursing you all the time. And, and uh, well, there were a few, there were a few of the Japanese guards that weren't too bad. What about uh, food? Would they take, uh, would you eat before you went out to work or take food with you? We'd or? have to take what food they had in our own mess hall, see. The Japanese gave us. Uh, our mess halls, and then they would uh, furnish uh, rice. We call it lugao, where the rice would be boiled, and, that would, and then it'd be poured out into your mess kit. It wasn't scraped out; it was poured. Poured. And uh, then there was saligu uh, the saligupans, and um, they're the they're the insects. Yes. Were uh, they boiled too? Oh yes. <coughs> yeah. Right in with the rice? It was always good that way. Yeah. That was a good way. And uh, then uh, there was, uh, there's a, uh, right there is what they call quanning. What's that? That picture right there. Yes. They're quanning. What does that mean? That means that they got a hold of uh, something and uh, killed it and are cooking it. I see. And then sharing it. What could that be? Well, in that case, it could have, it could be, uh, um, well, I suppose rabbit, squirrel. What about snakes? You ever eat any of that? Snakes too. Yes, yes. What kind of snakes were they? Poisonous? We had we had poisonous snakes. Yes. You killed them and ate them. Yes. Boiled them up. You ate everything that moved. I see. If it didn't move, you kick it a couple of times to get it to move. <laughs> well, there wasn't much moving around the camp then. After a while. Well, I should say not. Oh. Yeah, birds. Cats and dogs didn't even get close to the camp. For the first uh, first month or so, they did, and that was the end of them. <laughs> that was pitiful because uh, you know if you like a dog, you like a dog. And <laughs> what about uh, what about the fuel for the fires? Fires. For that well, that local? would be that would be the fuel from the from the jungle nearby. Yeah, yeah. you'd go out and do that. Yeah. yeah. What about, uh, did you ever get any tobacco from Japanese? That was an, a commodity that was, uh, that was a commodity that was respected, highly respected. By the prisoners and the by Japanese By the prisoner both? and the Japanese had Turkish cigarettes. They got their tobacco from Turkey because it was bright yellow. And uh, they were always, always hot to trade with them. If you had something you could trade, like a, a wristwatch or a ring, the Japanese were always willing to talk to you. Now, did they? Did that tobacco? Did that just go to the guards or to the prisoners also? The tobacco went to the uh, went to the guards. Guard. Did the prisoners get any tobacco? Oh, we would. We'd finagle it. Finagle it. Well, it grew there, of course. Huh? It grew naturally. Yeah. I mean, it could. Yeah. 
What well, about uh, records and so on? Of the, the Japanese keep records of you and. Well, yes, they did. Uh, the Japanese turned that uh, that privilege over to the Americans <laughs> themselves. I see. And then uh, <clears throat> our own uh, officers kept records of you prisoners. Uh, of the prisoners and you know, about sicknesses and medical care and. What about pay? You get any pay from the Japanese? Any yen? They from talked that? about it. They talked about it. They talked about it a lot. I see, yeah. <laughs> but I never saw any guy ever get a Social Security check or anything like that. <laughs> what about the Geneva Convention? You ever talk much about that? Never heard of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> no. No, sir. Now, when you were in this camp, did you were there any uh, American airplanes flying over or anything like no. that? No, yeah. but there were a lot of Japanese planes. Yeah. What did you think about the war at that time? I think it stunk. <laughs> did you think it was going to end or think we were going to win? Oh, or? yes. There was no question. Well, optimistic. We were optimistic. We never lost our morale. Uh, sure, that we knew we were going to win this war. That's why everybody wanted to live so bad. <laughs> what uh, what uh, kept you going then? Sort of, was that the, the idea of, of uh, winning the war and coming home. Yeah. What, there's a picture there on the screen now. Yeah, that's, that's a typical picture of the guys in Cabana to Juan. They, they all except the ones that I knew had G strings. Now they, this is a pair of uh, GI trousers that's been cut off. Wore but uh, you know what a G string is, don't you? No, I'm not. All right, a G string is uh, it's a big oversized jock strap. I see. Yeah. And that's what we wore. Nothing on top then. No, no, you never wore anything on the top because you had the in the rainy season that you got cold. But you put on some kind of a jacket or a sweater or something to cover you up. You ever get any clothes from the Japanese there? Yeah, they did. They issued some clothes once in a while, but they were, uh, uh, you know. Work clothes. Or they were like shorts. shorts. Oh, uh, shorts, yeah. G khaki GI shorts. What about shoes and stockings? No. You went barefoot most of the time. You did. <clears throat> How long did you stay there at that camp? You say two and a half? Two and a half years, and then I got called to go to uh, Manila. There was a prison ship leaving Bilibid Prison, and I'd be there for a couple of weeks, and then it'd be shipped on. Uh, and Bilibid Prison, now is that in, right in Manila? Right, and that's the old federal penitentiary that the Spanish used. Oh. <coughs> and I'd be there for a little while, and then they're going to ship me to Japan. How many of you went there? Well, out of this camp, there was over a thousand. That went to, yeah. yeah. They went to this camp. Uh-huh. And in, in the Philippines? In, in Manila. In Manila. And then you were to go on a ship, is that right? Yeah, the, uh, and I went up on the Noto Maru. That was the name of the ship, prison ship that I went yeah. on. And that took us uh, about 22 days to get up there. We were in the forward hold on that thing, and we were taken out of the hold once on the way up. And we were somewhere off from... Uh, uh, off from... Um, Oh, I can't think of the name of that. It was right Some off island of, or something? Or? Yeah, an island. And we were brought out of the hold so they could go down and scrub that hold out because that hold was filthy. You had nowhere to defecate. You had to use the place where you sat. You sat with your knee pulled up to your chest. And the guy in front of you hung over. And the How many guys were there in that hole? I'd say there was over a thousand. How big a how big a place was that hole on that ship? Oh, in feet we'll say uh, twenty by oh, thirty. Oh golly, I wouldn't I wouldn't be because uh, big as this uh, room or something? No, maybe almost as big as this room. You were just packed in there like packed in there, knees pulled up. What about getting sick and dying? Oh, they did. There was a lot of them that died. What'd they do, haul them out? Well, the worst, the worst thing that I can remember is the crying, the moaning, and the screaming. That these, the prisoners. And the cursing. Of the prisoners. And, uh, of course, the, they were sick, too, whoever was doing it. They were out of their head, too. They yeah. were screaming and hollering and cursing. Get any food down there? Oh, yes. They fed us, uh, uh, what I like, I, uh, kori. That's, a, that's a, uh, a kind of a vegetable chopped up. We got kori and we got uh, uh, all different kinds of soups. Did, how was that divided down there, or did you have a, something to eat out yeah, of it? Yeah, they'd come along and pour it out in your mess kit. The Japanese would? No, no, the Americans. Americans, yeah. 
Now this hole, was it, was it open or was it pretty well closed? Closed most of the time. Closed. And then when they opened it, everybody would get so joyous. The, <laughs> the fresh air coming oh. in. Oh, God, I'll never forget that. What, uh, go through any storms? Not to my knowledge, no. it could have, but... Uh, everything was... Uh, everything was locked up at that yeah. time. The hatch covers were on. And, and then as we got uh, to up toward Taiwan, up toward Japan, is when they became a little more liberal and let you have a little more fresh air. But before that, it was no fresh air at all. Was well, were there other prisoners on this same ship? Oh, yes. Yeah. Forward, there was the aft hold, the, yeah. the, and the uh, middle hold, and then the forward hold. And they all had uh, four, five, six hundred... Something like that, yeah, ...prisoners yeah. on it, yeah. Because when the Noto Maru pulled into, uh, into Moji, that's Moji, Japan, which is on the southern tip of Honshu. It's a large uh, island in Japan. Yeah. And then when they pulled out, why, we were left the ship, and then we realized what we'd been on. It was 20, approximately 26 days. Yeah. We, they'd look back and see the ship, and, the, and then we'd watch them take prisoners out of other holds. We knew that we were alone. And the, they were the, the, the hole that I was in, they didn't carry anyone out. No. But I heard that some died afterwards. When they got out? Yeah. Were there any that died on the trip that you know of? Not on the trip. No. But there were some that were pretty sick. They were sick, yeah. Yeah. Well, well that must, must have been a terrible experience in that ship. It was a hell ship. Yeah. There were, all the prison ships were hell ships. They were. Now, did they transfer all the prisoners from Jap Philippines to Japan? They were trying then. Trying. But I don't know now, when you talk about that, whether Santa Tomas, which was for civilians, Santa Tomas University was for civilians, and I never did hear whether they, they took any of them up there. What happened? Um, what happened when you got off the ship then? Well, say, I'll tell you, I'll ask you about the ring a little later on, later on when you, after the war. But now, when you got off this prison ship in Japan now, what happened then? Well, we were taken by a train. We went into a barn. I'll never forget this. We went into a huge barn on the docks. And I, oh, I was so tired. I wanted to lay down and stretch out so bad. And I got all stretched out and I got so comfortable when whistles began to blow and, and everybody, hiako, 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 every get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. And they were bringing, taking us out of that yeah. barn and they were going to take us onto a train and put us on that train. We just got through traveling. And they were on the ship. On the ship. Yeah. And they were going to take us by train to Tokyo. You go to Tokyo. And when we got to uh, Tokyo, they put us in a tea garden. And now it's daylight. A beautiful morning. They put us in a tea garden. We got all kinds of... That's the capital of Japan, now, yeah. Tokyo. And, uh, Must have been quite a ways up there. Oh, I don't remember how far it was, but we were down on the southern tip, you know, not too far out of Tokyo. And so we washed, and we were able to take a bath, we were able to clean ourselves up wash ourselves, and we were in filthy condition. And you take it, you could, in that tea garden, so-called tea garden, you uh, got baths? We on? got baths. They gave us great big qualies of hot water. And we bathed, and we cleaned ourselves up. And all the prisoners, or just a group? All the group, all the group I was with. Yeah. How many were there? I suppose there were about a thousand men. Yeah. And uh, we got that, got straightened out, and the next thing you know, we're on a train. Heading north, heading north on a train. And we'd look out the window. We weren't supposed to do this because of, but we had the window shades pulled so that we could just peek out and see the civilians and they all, holio, holio, that meant prisoner, prisoners. Everybody was, oh, holio, American holio. <laughs> and uh, the train took us north, north, north until we came to Moji, came to um, Sendai. Sendai, Japan, and we were taken off the train there. Where's that from, Tokyo? That's about, uh, oh, I would say it was roughly 300 miles north of Tokyo. And uh, we were taken on, now we're, now, we're, now we're high in the mountains. We got to Sendai, 
And then they took us off that, and we marched and marched in through the canyons and ravines back into uh, a, 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 a copper mine. Sendai it was a copper mining town. And it was there that they, we found a home for ourselves. It was brand new. How many prisoners were there now in that group that you went up there? About 500. Did you have food and water on the trip? Yes. The Japanese furnished them. Yeah. And they wanted you now as laborers, I suppose. We worked our way, worked our way. they gave us a real nice barracks. Yeah. And uh, it was there that we found out that we were going to work in a copper mine. So it was the next day, why, boy, they were turning them out. And we marched up and left uh, the prison camp and marched further up into the mountains to the Hanawa copper mine. And uh, Japanese women and Japanese children in that mine working. working? And uh, we went to, the, went to a level that hadn't been, the level that we went to was a level that hadn't been open for a hundred and some years. Was that down in the ground? Down in the ground. Yeah. Now I see on the screen they have another picture there. Um, uh, a little diff uh, Can you tell what that is? Uh, looks like they're in the mine there. Uh, maybe those uh, lights there from their caps. Oh, we yeah, the stats of May was what they called it. Uh, we were stats of May. They give you a dustpan, and you grab that dustpan back here and set it down. And then you got a hole like this, and you pull all that ore into that into the dustpan. And that's what you call Statsume. And then pour it into these kosha cars. And uh, these koshas were uh, four-wheeled cars on a track. And all that went into a smelter. Near the mountain, right on the outside of the mountain? Oh, inside of the mountain. Inside of the mountain? Inside of the mountain. See, we were in the level that we were at working had not been worked for a couple of hundred years but because of the fact that, uh, you know, didn't need the copper that bad or something. Yeah, and we were down there getting what they lost yeah. or what they messed up with. Yeah. That, now, how long were you on that uh, particular detail? That detail was 13 or 14 months. 14, yeah. And then the war was over. But now, when you were working on that detail, what about the food and uh, so on? Oh, I can't remember some of the food, but they, whatever they gave us was sure good. <laughs> yeah, you were hungry. Oh, we were so hungry. Now, how many men went into the mine? Did you? Did oh, we had. Broken uh, up into oh, different yeah, shifts? we had over a thousand. We had yeah. some British too that were taken prisoner in Singapore. I forgot to mention that. Oh yeah, they were with you. They yeah. were with us. And in this mine, then, did you, would you have a detail every day? Every morning at daylight. They have a roll call. Yep. Stasame, uh, that's what they call it. Itchi ni san si go roko sichi hachi ku. Ju itch, ju ne, so on. That's counting the Japanese. Now how, did you, how did you get along there in that camp? Did they ever beat you up or anything? Well, of course, they uh, you beat everybody up. I got thrown in the guardhouse for uh, stealing. I got thrown in the guardhouse for stealing. And uh, this what kind of stealing did you do? Oh, I steal, I, what I did was <laughs> I stole a fire ladder off of Japanese headquarters. See, it was the winter time when we were up there, and there was no heat. Yeah. So we had a, we had a stove. Nobody ever used it. So I, another guy and I went out and stole this fire ladder off of Japanese headquarters, brought it back, chopped it up, put it in the in the stove. Oh, was it ever nice. When that detail came in that night, it was the first time that they'd ever come into a warm barracks. <laughs> now, there was a picture there with some tall, tall Americans, just short Japanese. Was that a factor in, in, your, in your culture between the no. two? No. The tall, tall Americans and short ones? No, the tall Americans had come down with a crash. They would. The Japanese knew that. Yeah. There's a picture there up there. You can see that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the, the Japanese is a short person, a short person there, isn't it? Yes, they were. Yeah. How did? Uh, well, what happened then? Did they ever find out that you stole that ladder? Oh well, what happened to that? That's kind of a story in itself. Was, uh, but anyhow, uh, 
everything went along fine. We had two, we had two, uh, uh, the Japanese camp commander was Lieutenant Asaka, and the Japanese interpreter was uh, 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 Takahashi. And the Japanese interpreter was a pretty nice guy. He, he spoke good English. Yeah. He'd gone to school in England. And uh, anyhow, uh, we took that fire ladder, and boy, we sure got a lot of pleasure out of that. And uh, about a week, yeah, right, about a week later, why, uh, I was on quarters at that time. Sick or something. Yeah, I can't remember what it was, but I was on quarters at that time. And uh, the details all came in from the mine, and they were uh, pretty well bagged out. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, Taka, or Asaka, come, uh, the commander, come in and said, uh, 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 he says, we would like your attention, please. He spoke good English. The Japanese know who the men were that took the fire ladder off from Japanese headquarters. Psycho Yampan, that was the section we were in. Section 4A will not be fed until at such time as these men turn themselves over for punishment to the Japanese. Well, you know, eating was a big factor. Sure. As we sat there and across Gordon and this Gordon Hilton would look over at me and I'd look over at him. <laughs> Finally, get the, we do, well, we better go. And everybody was looking at us, because <laughs> they knew who there was. Yeah. So we got some extra clothes, got some extra jackets, got on, and we <laughs> turned ourselves over to Takahashi. Oh, he said, you steal that fire ladder. Oh, that's not nice. The Japanese no like that. So what he says, uh, then Asuka, talked to come out, come out and he was a fine looking officer and he spoke excellent English too and he talked to Takahashi for a few minutes and finally they, we went back and they called for uh, the three little little Japs come out of the out of the barracks Taksan Bento Taksan Bento we knew what that meant that meant Taksan beating they came on, boy, did they ever beat us. <laughs> and they taught. Beat the, you with the, the sticks, sir? No, no, they came out with sticks, but uh, Takahashi being a, uh, he was a pretty good jab. He says, uh, no, no, weapons nigh, or in other words, weapons nigh. Takahashi binto, means judo. So anyhow, uh, I got a lot of flying time in that time. <laughs> and uh, so anyhow, uh, finally I ended up on a, as this was in the winter time, and I ended up underneath the barracks where the water had been running off from the ceiling and formed big icicles down there. And I got ran one of those icicles right up underneath my back. I couldn't hardly breathe. And I said, Mati, 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 <laughs> no more, no more. And so they took through Gordon and I into a little ASO, they call it, a little guardhouse. You can't stand up and you can't lay down. And we got in there, and I was there for, we were there for about a week with a little water and a little rice. And uh, <clears throat> then the American camp commander it was a guy from, lived, from, lived in Glendale, California. The camp commander, the Japanese? No, no, the American. American, yeah, American. okay. And he lived in Glendale, California. And he came in and talked to uh, Asaka and to uh, Takahashi and uh, talked to him and he said, let them out, let them out, see. And so they turned us loose. And they sent it back to the barracks. And that was Christmas, that was the Christmas day. That they'd let you out of, of that. Yeah, I just thought of that. Yeah. That was Christmas day of 1945. 44. 44, all right, yeah. 44, 44. Yeah. Christmas day of 1944, I'll never forget that. And that was my Christmas present, to get out of that guardhouse. But I still was having trouble taking deep breaths. Did they have any other prisoners there besides you no, and two or three? Nobody no. would be dumb enough to do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what about uh, dental work? Are you having toothache or Never. medical, medical problems good, there? Excellent teeth. Well, we had, we had dentists. We had dentists, and they were just as much a prisoner as we were. Japanese, uh, American? Americans. Dentists and doctors. Hey, by the way, yeah, you brought up that. They did bring, I remember one time while we were at Hanawa, we were called in, the detail of uh, uh, Psycho Yampan, Section 40 was called in, and they looked at our teeth. They but did. that was all. That's all, yeah. 
Did they have a hospital there? You know yeah, of? we had a hospital because I went when they turned turned me out of that uh, out of that ASO out of the guardhouse. They took me to the hospital. Uh, Prison hospital. Yeah, but there was just a few of the guys in there that were pretty sick men, and there wasn't anything wrong with me. So, I well, was just fine. How far were you from a town now? Hanawa was about uh, a little. It's a very small town. It was a. a Oh, I suppose a half a mile from the prison camp. Now this uh, copper, now was that loaded on cars and shipped out? Oh no, it was. Uh, we were so far down. I don't know how many hundred of feet. It you, takes us you, half an hour to get out of that mine. Well, down you down in the ground, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it was all on 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 road track. Oh yeah. But this uh, this this area had been mined for many hundreds of years. Copper. Yeah. What about the refined mine that you guys dug out there? What happened to that? Uh, that all went to uh, a, a smelter yeah. that was right near Hanawa. And we had British prisoners of war working that smelter. And uh, uh, the <clears throat> I, got a, I was able to get, catch on to a lot of this stuff after the war was, or after we got out of the mine, because we went to a kind of a lumber deal where we were cutting up some lumber. And it was it was nice to be out in the daytime, and to yep. see daylight, and to see the other people working, and get to talk to other people, coming out of that dark mine. Well, how long were you in that dark mine? Fourteen or fifteen months. And then you went out to this uh, sawmill or the lumber mill. And then we went out there for but uh, about uh, about two weeks or three weeks, I see. so that I had an opportunity to see what was going on, yeah. and then we were liberated. Well, what did you do in this saw, sawmill then, or this lumber mill? What did you do there? We were lo moving lumber around, carrying it, moving it around, going into uh, camps nearby, picking up lumber, bringing it out. These, were you working now with other prisoners or civilians? Yes, yes. People you knew. Oh. People that were out of the same camp with you. Oh. Now you say how how did you now you say you you worked there until the war was over, until we got word from uh, Asaka that he had a message for us, and we all went out. We thought we were going to be shot because they had the 50 caliber machine guns mounted up in that camp, and any time that uh, the, the, they were to be used against us in the event the war the, that we were were no longer prisoners. Oh, I see. And so anyhow, this is what the, th the anticipation was that they were going to turn those 50 calibers on us. But one of the things that was very encouraging was the fact that we came out in the compound and there were no one near those 50 calibers and the hoods were still on them. And That's I, in the, you were in a compound with uh, where the barracks were. So yes. They had a parade field there. So. Yes. Uh-huh. Asika came out and he, his arms were folded like this and he said, you will, oh, I wish I'd have brought that speech because I have it at home. You will be so happy to know that our two loving countries have come to an agreement. <laughs> and then he went on. Oh, I wish I'd have brought that speech. Anyhow, he was laying right there on the desk, yeah. too. Anyhow, uh, the, there wasn't a sound made. He said, you will be he says, you will be uh, guarded by the Japanese against the civilians. We are afraid. I remember this part. The, Mar the Japanese civilians will retaliate. Retaliate for what? <laughs> and uh, then he said, that is all. You can go back to your barracks. And the guys all turned around. There were 500 of us in that compound. Turned around and they walked back. There wasn't a sound made. And then when they got inside the barracks, then you started to hear them crying and screaming and yelling and swearing and oh, they were really going to town. And I went back from the Gordon, Gordon Hilton and I go back to this where we were, we were in a, a, a <clears throat> bay, they call it a bay. Yeah. We went back and he put his arm around me, and I put my arm around him, and I said, I was expecting this. <laughs> he says, so was I. <laughs> the war was over. Our two loving countries are going to come and get us. 
about two days later, why there was a there was no more shikoto, no more, no more work. And uh, so we lay in there in the barracks sleeping, and all of a sudden we heard somebody screaming and yelling. We woke up, and here uh, a, a weapons carrier, American or uh, Japanese? <laughs> Excuse me. American weapons carrier came into the camp with three Americans in it. They jumped out, and of course everybody says, my God, it's Americans, my God, it's the Americans. Well, they got out, and these guys were just young fellows, you know, and they were on a, a atrocity detail. Oh, They were to go out and check out all the atrocities that were supposed to have been committed by the Japanese. And they pulled up in that doggone weapons carrier, and they got out, and the first thing the guy says, What's, you got any money on you? What's the money look like? <laughs> they reached their pocket. They this is, these are pesos, and uh, this is American currency, and it didn't look anything like what we were used to seeing. And they, you got any pictures of your family? You know, how about your wife? <laughs> and they pulled out the pictures. They said, this is my wife. This is my daughter. And this is the first white woman we'd seen in, in three and a half years. <clears throat> and the guys gathered around them, and they... <laughs> Well, they, they said, we're not, hey, we didn't come in here to spend the afternoon with you. We got in a couple of other camps down there. We didn't even know there was another prison camp nearby. So they took off, and that was the last we saw them. But boy, that was, uh, I'll never forget that day that the Americans came to in the camp. Only three of them. Did they have any food with them? No. No. How long were they there in camp before they left? Did you stay oh, there? Yeah, yeah, we stayed there because the Americans were going to get us out of there. Yeah, we were going to take a train out. Yeah. Did you know anything about the atomic bomb or anything like that? We heard about it afterwards. What about? Uh, we were only a, we were only a, we'll see. That was at Hiroshima, yeah. and uh, Nagasaki was south of us. Yeah. Hiroshima was west of us. But you didn't see her. No. What about those fire bombs or bombing by the American Air Force? Of those. We cities? heard about those too. You didn't see anything. There were no bombers that near you that bombed. Hanawa, we never got any bombing in Hanawa. No, no. Well, boy, did we, when we came through Hiroshima, before, uh, on our way to this prison camp, it was a beautiful city. It was, yeah. And then when we left here, we left uh, Hanawa, we went through Hiroshima, and oh my God, it was just rubble. It, uh, yeah. Uh, it was terrible. Now, how did the uh, how did the uh, civilians treat you now when you you say oh, there was a problem there? Oh, the <laughs> they were very oh, careful. Oh, oh, <laughs> They knew they lost. I mean, yeah, the civilians. They were serious. <laughs> what about the what about the army, Japanese army? We never guys. saw any of them. They uh, kinda, whatever happened to them? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we did know that there was individuals that we wanted, and we were going to get. They were cruel. Uh, civilian yeah. guards. Oh, civilian guards. Civilian guards. And uh, the, the army left uh, two days before. I see. They were the, uh, in uniform and everything. They got out of there. But these civilian guards, oh, they were brutal. And when, uh, when we, at Hanawa, we never got a one. They got out of there and disappeared. But in some of the other camps, the guys who Mention the fact that they had uh, shokos that they got and killed them. That was they were civilian guards. Civilian guards. Yeah. Guarding the camp, the outside. Yeah. Has it been in clothes on? Yeah. But they were brutal. They were. What about uh, were there many that died in that camp now that you were yes. the last camp you were yes. at? Yes. Yeah. Did Japanese bury them or did Americans bury no, them? No, cremated. What? Always cremated. They were cremated. In Always Japan. cremated. Yeah, we had Americans and we had Japanese that were cremated. They saved the dog tags then for record purposes. Were, that's right. Americans kept records. Yes. Asaka turned over all the records to, uh, like I say, he was a pretty good Jap. Yeah. And uh, uh, Takahashi too. So that when we left the prison camp, they came up and they said, "We go along too. We go. You take us with you." Because we were going to the Americans. Sure. Well, wouldn't you naturally think under the circumstances they'd want to go the other way? Yeah. But no, they wanted to go, and they did. And they were, I heard later on that Takahashi was released from custody of the uh, MPs, 
and uh, uh, so was the other one. Well, because they had been kind to us, yeah, and hadn't brutalized any of the prisoners. No, they didn't. Takahashi kicked the hell out of me, but I had it coming. That was when I stole that fire ladder. Yeah, yeah. Now, how? When would you get your first American food? We'll say when you were uh, released there at that camp. Oh, uh, or how did they? How did they go about uh, helping you out? Well, when the Americans came, they came in a jeep, and the they stayed one. a couple of hours, and that yeah. was, and then they disappeared. And then we were taken out of there and put on a train at Hanawa, the little village, and we were taken to a place called Sendai, which was a seacoast town, which was probably six hours by train. And on at Sendai, we boarded a big hospital ship, and that was the first white woman we saw in three now, and a half years. Did you get any food in between that and the time you got on that? Ship? Oh yeah, it was a bindle, little box, little boxes of food from the Japanese. Yeah. For they gave each prisoner. Yeah. Yeah. Then we boarded. Then we uh, boarded the ship, the beautiful, big, big hospital ship at uh, Hanawa at uh, Sendai. That's in Japan, the southern port. There's up on the southern, yeah. And uh, the, that's all they wanted to do is feed us. We just sat around a mess ball all the time. How many get, how many would get on the ship then? How many POW? Oh, gosh. So there's ha several hundred. Yeah, several thousand. Yeah, thousand, yeah. Thousand, yeah. Then where'd you go? Then we went right down to, uh, um, well, we, I went right back to the Philippines. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I went to, uh, we went to uh, Yokoh Yokohama, Tokyo, Yokohama, and then you made a decision there where you're going, and then they put you on another ship. And most At of the Yokohama. Guys, huh? At Yokohama. Yeah. yeah. Most of the guys wanted to go right, uh, right to back to the States, but I wanted to go back to the Philippines because that's where that ring was. Could you tell us a story about that ring, Ronnell? Well, the way this, <laughs> I never thought about that until just before I came up here. Uh, my first sergeant and I were downtown Manila one Saturday night. And Just hold the ring up there so we could see it. And uh, he was, uh, we were talking about going out to the Poodle Dog, which was a, a bar. And uh, it was popular, popular with the 31st Infantry. And so anyhow, uh, I, uh, I said, well, where are you going to get any money? I said, payday is another five days. And he says, well, you got that ring, you can put that ring in the hock. And I said, well, that's my grandmother's wedding ring. And he says, well, he said, we'll get it out of hock. He said, we're going to be paid in five days. Well, five days, the war was going to be on. started. And so anyhow, uh, I said, well, okay, we'll go down to Pedro Cruz, because I know him personally. So he went down about a block and a half down the street, and I hocked the ring. And uh, I got five pesos for it. That's two and a half dollars gold. <laughs> and so anyhow, then uh, we went to the Poodle Dog. And uh, when I went back to the barracks, which was two days later, why well, goodness sakes, they were preparing for war then. And, I got, and my, my ring was at Pedro Cruz, see? And by that time, we I'd gone into the field and we'd gone up toward Clark Field. And we were billeted up there for just a short time. And then were you ever at Clark Field? Oh, yeah, I've been there many times. Well, was there much damage done, or did you see any airplanes? No, nah, after the war started, I wasn't at Clark oh, Field. Oh, I see, yeah. After the war, but there wasn't, I don't think it was very much damage. No, no. Anyhow, uh, we got to, uh, after, we got, went back, and we went down into Bataan right away. And that's the most godforsaken, isolated place in the world. And uh, so that's where I ended up, was down there. And then... The Baton, that's the peninsula. The peninsula. peninsula entering, right outside of Manila. Entering, yeah, I, entering Manila Bay. Yeah. And so anyhow then, uh, uh, I never got back to get the ring until the war was over. And then when the war was over, instead of asking, instead of coming back to the United States, I wanted to go back to the Philippines because the, the Philippines had a soft spot in my heart. I knew a lot of Filipinos, and they were a lot of good friends that took care of me during combat times, and uh, the families were good to me, and I felt a lot of the, 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 the uh, grief that they felt. So I went back to the Philippines and went back up to Clark Field and, and through there, and uh, 
I, first place I went was to look for from Pedro Cruz. <laughs> How many men were there with you now? Were you alone more, or more? I was alone. 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 Yeah, they'd pop up here and there, you yeah. know. Everybody was on their own. When they were liberated, there were guys that were liberated by the troops from the, from uh, down in the uh, south, in the southern islands, you know, the, uh, the um, Malayan, Malayan islands, guys that were with me there. And <clears throat> They were all over, but anyhow, we'd see everybody that w we knew. Yeah. And then they came to uh, the 29th replacement and said, anybody that was interested in going back to the States, there's a C C-47 or C-54 that's leaving leaving uh, uh, Nichols Field, you could catch a ride on that. Well, I spent then, I spent about 30 days over there. So I decided I better get home because if I didn't, my mother would kill me. So I, I, I boarded that plane, they flew us to Hawaii, and they wouldn't even let us get off the airplane. They just brought, took us right on into San Francisco. What, uh, what, how was your medical condition then when you got there? Did you go to a hospital well, in San Francisco? Yes, I, yeah, or? I was put in a hospital right away and uh, was treated there and nursed there and babied there. And then the next thing, they put me on another uh, flight, or put me on a train, a hospital a train. To Clinton, Iowa. Schick General Hospital in Clinton, Iowa. That is a temporary hospital? Well, it wasn't exactly a temporary. It was a beautiful big hospital oh, okay. there. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> there was an awful lot of the POWs we, we ended up there. Yeah. All the guys out of Chicago and, and through that area. How long were you there? I was in, uh, in Clinton, Iowa, December, January, February. Three months? Three months. Mm -hmm. I, there was nothing seriously wrong with me. No. They fed you good and so on. And oh yeah, I was in pretty good shape. When, when did they discharge you from the service then? Uh, the 23rd of uh, March. At Clinton, Iowa? At uh, Clinton, Iowa. Yeah. And then you went right home. Yeah. How, how did your How'd your folks uh, take it when you were gone? Your mother and dad? And well, them? I'll tell you, I often think of that because my mother was uh, my mother and dad were both getting along in years. My mother, my dad was in poor, very poor health. And my mother was not a bit well at all. And uh, they were both getting along in years. And I'm the only child. So you can well imagine the anxiety that they went through. And of course our news media was a little rough on them too. T quoting the stories of the atrocities that were being committed. Yeah and so forth. So when I got back to the States, I, I made that first phone call from San Francisco. To your folks? To my folks, and I didn't know what in I... In Lisbon? In Lisbon. I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea whether my mother was alive or my father was alive. And uh, well, the town the size of Lisbon, where the telephone, chief telephone operator knew my folks real well. And uh, so first question I had, Mom, How's, how's dad? And the operator said, here he, here he is, Leon, or here he is, Brownell, here he is. And <laughs> she, Dorothy, <laughs> Dorothy put me on. He said, your dad's on the phone now. And I'm in San Francisco, see? And I said, dad? And he says, how are you, son? How are you? You got both your legs and both your arms. <laughs> I said, yeah, I got them all. <laughs> but that was a kind of a small town deal, you know. Yeah. Dorothy had been waiting for the word come from the South Pacific, and everybody, I guess, had been to see if I was. Another one over there, there was Bob Brutton from Lisbon. He was on Cregador. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he came home with me. I found him. He's dead now. He died a couple of years ago. Were there any other uh, North Dakota guys there that, that went through? Uh... Yeah, there were. Peter Redderath from. Uh, out west there. You know, Pete, he belongs to our yeah, organization. Yeah, yeah Pete Redderath and uh, Mikey Dovervich and... Uh, Do oh. What did Dovervich do during the war then? Well, he you? escaped. Yeah, I know he's... And he, I don't know what he did after up, that. Yeah. There's never much talk about it. Oh. I've tried to find out where... where He said he made it down to Mindanao. Yeah. And he lived down there. So... How did the VA treat you since... Uh, or the oh, Veterans Administration boy. government? <laughs> they were just wonderful. Yeah. 
I can never, never say that they weren't. They were just wonderful to me. Wherever you went. Wherever I went. San Francisco, uh, anywhere. Yeah, Minneapolis or Fargo. Yeah, oh, yeah. Minneapolis was outstanding. Yeah. yeah. They were carrying me around. Yeah. But... Uh, they were the, you. You couldn't. You come to a VA hospital, and you, you mention the fact that you were a prisoner, a Japanese prisoner, and boy, I'll tell you, the silver tray was rolled out. Yeah. Well, that's pretty nice. Yeah. It is. Say, uh, now you weren't married now during the period of the war, were you? Oh no. Then you got married after the war. Yeah, uh, that was uh, my. I'll tell you what happened. I had a young officer in my outfit. It was a real swell guy, Gordon Utke. By the way. He and I went to the university together. You said you were dead. Yeah, yeah you were dead. So uh, I, uh, well, you I know can't him. place him in my mind. I but know, I know. boy, he was a great guy. Yeah. And he, he was, was a, a he was a commandant of cadets at the University of North yeah, Dakota he when was I was there. Yeah. First lieutenant in my outfit. Yeah. And then they transferred him out just about the time the war started, and sent him to an outfit down in in uh, Mindoro, I think it was. Yeah. Out on the Mindoro. And he was. Oh, he, we, we get back to the States, we're going to get together. Oh, boy, he says, we got to get together. And I said, well, that's a great idea, because his mother and my mother by that time had become pretty good friends. So he, he mentioned the fact. This was, this was uh, Lieutenant Rutke, or yeah, that time, uh -huh. captain. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, but that time I was over in the, this time, now uh, we were over in the Philippines. And I saw him at Cabana Duan prison camp about, uh, oh, I think it was about three hours before a Japanese patrol came into that camp and took me out. He and I sat there, and it was the first time I saw him all during the war, see? And he said, the first one of us that gets back to the United States has got to look the other one up. Now, don't forget that. Don't forget that. And I said, okay. I, he said, and I said, where, now, where are your, your, where is your family now? And I knew they were in Anderlin, but he had a sister, and she was in Santa Cruz, California. And he says, Florence is in Santa Cruz, California. Mother and dad are back in Nanderland and are probably with your folks now. And then we heard this patrol coming, about three Japs coming down there, driving all the, uh, everybody into the barracks, and then they were going to take so many out to uh, take them to a uh, prison camp up in Japan, see? So I said goodbye to him, and by golly, I went out on that Noto Maru. That was that Japanese prison ship. And I got back to the States, and about a year later, I met his sister. Florence, and she was in, in Santa Cruz, California. I'm damned if I didn't marry her. I see. Now, she was a sister to Gordon. Gordon, yeah. He died. He was killed. He was killed on a, on the, on a, on a, on a, on a Japanese prison ship going from Subic Bay to Japan just before the war was over. American planes were coming into the Philippines then, and they, these bombers came in, and they strafed it and took her down. Took the ship that he was on. Dwight, uh, Dwight Hunkins was on that boat too. I see. Yeah. And that's his sister. Then you married his sister. Yeah. Yeah. In and you lived then, spent years in uh, Valley City. Yes. Yeah. 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 She and I got married in Valley City. Yeah. Uh, How many children did you have? Three. Three. Three boys: Frankenstein, Dracula, and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> three boys. <laughs> now where are they? Well, uh, the two of them are in Minneapolis, and the third one's out at Tacoma. Tacoma, yeah. And you, and you were in the post office then, and, uh, is that right? No, I went to work for the newspaper. Where about uh, so? advertising, the Valley City Times Record. Oh. And uh, I worked there for about oh gosh, I must have been there for a couple of years, and then they, uh, the the postmaster retired. And I had a committee come in one day and want to know if I wanted that job as postmaster. And I, of course, I'm going according to, you know, you're in as, you're in, in as postmaster as long as the Republicans or the Democrats are sure. in power. Yeah. I said, no way, I didn't want that. And they said, well, now things have changed a lot. This is a, this is a permanent appointment by the Senate. Yeah. Oh, that's different. So you took the test then, and uh, twenty-eight years in there. You were there twenty-eight years, Valley City. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you you were the main post. Most. How many men did you have in the post office there? Twenty-six, I think. Twenty-six men working there. You had a lot of rural carriers. And three. Three. Yeah. And then town carriers and so on. City carriers, we had, uh, I think, eight. Yeah. 
What, uh, what would you do in life now if you had to live it over again? Or how, how do you look upon your life? Or I'd kill that recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> I'd shoot him. <laughs> well, yeah, but he might have sent you, he well, might have well, uh, some guy that would send you in the Navy or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, uh, nothing like the United States Army. you yeah. got to join the United <laughs> States Army. <laughs> benefits, the benefits you get oh, are outstanding, outstanding. <laughs> Well, you were you you done quite a bit for the prisoners of war here in North Dakota, Brown Ellen. <laughs> so uh, they're getting fewer and well, fewer. I'll tell you, there's a, well, that was a grand bunch of guys, I'll tell you. Yeah, they were. Yeah. What uh, What do you think now, Brown Ellen, about the world? You think it's getting better or worse? Or what What do you think? Well, I really haven't uh, tried to put it together, but the way things sound is not getting any better. I think it'll always be the way it always yeah. has been. Yeah. There, there's all war and rumors of war all the time. You think if they started a war, you'd run down to the recruiting station again? Well, if the Japs did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thanks a lot. It was uh, fun visiting with you, Brown Allen. You uh, you had an interesting story. and uh, Well, I hope it's been interesting. Yeah, you, uh, you played You know, your... so many times people say, well, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about it. I find it does a lot for me well, I think to talk about good. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like a, yeah. I relieve myself yeah, to a great right. extent. Uh, I think if you hold it in too much, it's Yeah, uh, I do too. Yeah. And of course, we understand too that the atrocities that were committed are just unmentionable. Yeah. And uh, but not so much to the soldiers or to the military, but. Well, Let me prove that it adores the loveliness of yours. All my life I've felt content to stargaze at the sky. Now I only want to melt the stardust in your eyes. When, if ever, will my lips know If it's me for whom those eyes glow Makes no difference where you are Your eyes still hold my wishing star Oh, star eyes How lovely they are 